So in a way, this is going to be my, uh, my definition of what I think computational design is, uh, but also a method of getting us all on the same page so that we have similar, similar terms. <laughs> so what is computational design? It's more than this. I think a lot of us, when we first get introduced to computational design, we think Zaha Hadid, we see crazy forms. And yes, this is computational design, but it's much more than that. Uh, yes, you can create wild forms. You can use algorithms to do things that were never feasible to do on your own. But it's a much, much broader topic than that. And it's much more applicable uh, than just uh, crazy design. Most people would see that thing on the upper left, which looks like an animal, and say, well, I don't do those projects. Computational design isn't for me. So I'm here to say that computational design is for you. No matter what your project is, you have an opportunity to leverage data and to leverage um, algorithms to do things differently. Because in the end of the day, when I say computational design, I'm simply describing the digital age disrupting our industry. And so looking at this timeline here, in many ways, architecture, the AEC industry, is still stuck in AutoCAD, which is a pre-internet technology. That's like neolithic stone tools, you know? Like that's, that paradigm uh, is from a different age. Um, Google started in 1998. The only reason I know that is because I Googled it. Right? We can't even imagine the world without some of these things. Revit, I think it was 2002, pointing out that that's a pre-iPhone uh, pre technology. And can you remember the world before we all have something like this in our pockets right now? Um, Facebook 2004, revolutionizing it. I mean, this is just a story of, of the modern world. <coughs> Uber, 2015. I can't get around Detroit without Uber. Or now those new little scooter things. I don't even know what that is. Point is, things change really quickly. Things change very rapidly, but our industry has not. And our business practices haven't. Because we have inertia. We're businesses that are we're optimized to work a certain way. And tech has changed so fast that we've all been left behind, essentially. So this group is here to help us all um, learn the new ways of working, because things are changing. If the rest of the world is changing, do we expect our industry? Not. Of course not. Of course our industry is going to be rocked by the same forces that are revolutionizing everything else. So that is what I would call computational design. It is the information age entering our, our business. And the most obvious way that this is happening is through Grasshopper and Dynamo. So Grasshopper is to Rhino, what Dynamo is to Revit. These are visual programming interfaces. And all that means is that we all in this room have an easier time to learn to code. Because a visual scripting interface doesn't look like code. If you think code, you think matrix, you think that awful class you never wanted to take that you had to, you know, it's, it's not fun for most visual people. Most architects are very visual people. But this is what visual programming looks like. It's a series of inputs and outputs with little blocks uh, where you can visually just connect one thing to the next. You don't have to learn Python. You don't have to learn any of these uh, fancy languages. Uh, it's very easy to pick up, which means that sort of what's the big deal about this is that the power of algorithms, the power of coding, is now in our hands, which means we don't have to wait for Autodesk. Sorry if there's any Autodesk people out there. We don't have to wait for software developers, uh, people who know the tech, to solve our problems. We know our problems. If we can get our hands on the ability to code, we can solve our problems ourselves. And that really is a breakthrough. Um, parametric modeling is what this enables. So just diagrammatically here, it's called parametric modeling because it's based on an input parameter. And essentially what code allows you to do, those little um, nodes with the wires, if you know what your rules are for your, the logic of your design, and you know what your certain design decisions or your input parameters are, you can build a model that takes any combination of input parameters. The model itself takes data, it takes rules, and it spits an output. And all of that is contained within your Grasshopper or your Dynamo script. So it's just input is output. And you define what goes in between, because you can now learn to code. But what's weird about this, and really the underlying reason for why we need all to be here to talk about this, is whereas traditional software, traditional tools, they did something. Uh, Ecotech did environmental analysis. Autodesk drafted, right? All of our tools did something. If you got handed it, you knew what to do. Um, but so it's more like a big hammer, right? Give yourself a hammer, you can find a nail, you can nail it. But a computational platform like Grasshopper or Dynamo, it can do anything that you want it to, which makes it really difficult to use because there is no instruction manual. We all need to determine what we want to do. So it's more like one of those crazy KUKA robots where you can program it to do anything, but what to do. Nobody knows. And until you know what to do, you don't know how to use it. And then why would you ever learn it if you don't know what it can do for you, right? So it's this catch-22, and we're all stuck in the same spot. 
So we're all here now to break through that logic. Um, because it's a different way of thinking. It's a way of thinking algorithmically, thinking parametrically about your design process. Um, and without scaring anyone too much, this is a, um, an ad uh, with a, an internship um, call for people. What's that called now? Word escaping me. If you want a job working for WeWork, this is what they posted and the skills that they're asking for, for one of their design interns. And they're calling them augmented design intern, which is really interesting because what they want is someone, an augmented designer, someone who knows how to leverage the computer to augment their process. So it's no longer a black cape architect with the stroke of his pen saying that's the perfect thing. They're looking for people who know how to leverage the machine as well. Now it's not the machine dictating the design, but it's the designer knowing how to use the machines properly. And you probably can't read all these little words, but a few things I want to point out here. They're asking for similar things that architects do, right? Being able to collaborate, work effectively on a small team, passionate about shaping the future of architectural practice. But then they have things like um, hands-on skills in Python, JavaScript, and C Sharp. Well, that's not my skill set. Um, these are a plus. It's, um, knowledge of computer graphics and machine learning techniques. Experience coding collaboratively with a source control system like Git. These are all software developer skills. But that's what um, this firm is looking for. And I use WeWork as an example because they are a very different kind of um, firm. They're not a traditional architecture firm. But they're really leading the way in a lot of these computational design firms. So the point is, new jobs require new skills. This is a new age of architecture. We have brand new capabilities. Um, and we all need to upskill. We all need to figure out what's possible. It's hard. But together, we can make it. So we've got a few videos here um, to showcase how some other companies in the, um, across the country and the world are leveraging computational design. This here is an example if, um, there we go, it's working, of a, a computational design workflow, start to finish. So this is Grasshopper, um, where they are defining the building algorithmically. So rather than modeling it directly, they are cutting it out of the sphere um, and using scripts to to parametrically generate the forms. That's Grasshopper on the right. It gets messy. Um, but this is all done through rules and logic and data flows. So just to give you kind of a sense. So nothing is ever directly physically made. It's defined, if you will. The, the script itself holds the logic and the rules. So here you see it um, and pushing data between a variety of different uh, platforms. So here they start with one single point at the very top of the script. And um, they set up all these design <coughs> parameters, the major decisions. You see on the left there, these are the, the rules that control that outline of that shape that we saw previously. And so before you know it, they've now cut out the, uh, the form. Now, if you adjust the slider, you saw that form shift around because it's all based on the definition of the radius. As the radius changes, the building will automatically update. I assume this is some kind of uh, workflow. Um, give a shout out to Leo uh, Dali and uh, Walter P. Moore. They're the, the architects who worked on this. And then there's all these scripts for panelizing a facade, where you can parametrically subdivide, and then um, gather all the data in those facade panels, whether it's the coordinates, whether it's the type, whatever information you have. And you can uh, move that from a program like Grasshopper or Rhino, push that into Excel, read that into Revit, automatically generate your um, true Revit geometry with all of the built-in family parameters that you need. And all of this will be automated. So this here is using uh, adaptive components to build a variety of different panel types, and then automatically distribute those and generate them across uh, the facade. So I think this project had a very, and I'll go all the way now to construction documents. So that entire process, start to finish, is all collected within a variety of different scripts so that the designers can work um, much more quickly um, in an automated way. So a lot of this, it's like you're building robots to do the stuff you don't want to do anyway, and that gives you more time to design. At the end of the day, it's a, it's a beautiful building. And there are many examples of this type of workflow, and I know we blew through it, but uh, we're going to have more detailed examples um, coming up. In fact, I'm going to move forward. This video is from Eric talking about how they see information transforming the industry.
So the digital transformation for Arab in, in our region is all about understanding our industry as an information industry. Uh, any typical project stage will start with the information that we receive when we begin and it will end with the information that we deliver. So any deliverable that we're used to, like uh, drawings, reports, calculations, uh, and 3D models, for instance, uh, they can just be considered as uh, data containers, or data sets, we can call them. These data sets are typically created through a process of different tasks that keep enriching the information of the data every step along the way. Each process creates a new data set based on the available information and the skills of the engineers combined with their knowledge and their experience. Now it is important that this data is stored in a location where anyone can have access to it and in a format that anyone can read because having this data stored in a consistent way will really facilitate automizing the processes that we would normally do manually. A design or engineering project should be regarded as a machine where information freely flows from one process to the next. Any manual tasks will be performance bottlenecks to the entire project. We need to minimize the number of manual tasks and maximize the amount of automated processes. The digital design training program is a major step in the East Asia digital transformation. And by training a huge number of staff, we really intend to create momentum so we can change the way we work daily. And we hope that this information and knowledge will then actually spread through the edges of the company. This training program is tailored to raise the awareness of the importance of a fully automated design workflow. It is not here to tell you how to better do your job, but it is designed to equip you with the right mindset and the right tools to start this journey yourself. It's an exciting journey and we are really happy to start this journey with our Arab staff. So motivational music aside, that's I think a pretty good description of what we're trying to say. Uh, this is from MBBJ. Uh, I'm personally very, very impressed with their uh, their digital studio. Um, some of the the best free applications out there um, were developed by workers at this company. So shout out to them. And this here is a video showcasing, I think, particularly what Human UI, which is a, a plugin for Grasshopper that allows you to make really nice interfaces without having to know anything about how to make nice interfaces. So you can do all this through Grasshopper. So this one here appears to be a, uh, a planning script that will automatically mask and stack as you um, change different parameters for, this looks like a, uh, a lab building or a hospital. This one here is automatically designing a landscape um, design on the left there, depending on a variety of different sizes. So you can explore your design as it changes. What is this? Um, this one seems to be their own custom interface that they use to deliver information to their staff. This here is another planning script where you adjust the different parameters of the, uh, the massing. It's a dashboard of information to inform the design team very quickly about um, different types of things. This one here is for lab model planning. And these are all data dashboards. So as you make decisions, you're able to see in real time a variety of different metrics. Um, this is a more advanced one that is, I think, actually tracking um, nurses and uh, going very quickly. The idea is that we can now build our own dashboards to design with data more effectively than we ever have before. And this is giving you a quick, really brief overview of the types of things that are now possible. So in a way, we build these tools that are um, very customized to our workflows. So this was built by somebody at an architecture firm. These software platforms, which is really what they are, they weren't developed by an outside company. They were developed by us. We know our problems. We know what we need. We can then build our own solutions. We can even make really cool looking software interfaces, right? That looks like a legit program. Um, because somebody else did all the code for you, you get to reuse some of their things. Um, so without belaboring the point too much, uh, this is a big topic. There's a lot of things to do. And one of the major problems that we all tend to face is not knowing where to begin. Um, yes, you might need to learn Grasshopper or Dynamo. That's an entry into this world but what to do with it. We all have different things that we care about. Um, we like to break it down into four major topics. 
Uh, geometric exploration, these are the building fancy shapes. A lot of the workflows we already saw are this. Interesting forms, analyzed facades, uh, parametric modeling, a lot of that fits under geometric exploration. But that's just one of the four buckets here. Uh, performance analysis is kind of where I began in this whole thing. Automating your analysis workflows. What used to take 80 hours might only take eight hours if you can use parametric modeling or, and these scripts to streamline that entire process. So maybe all your buildings get daylighting analysis. Maybe they can all get energy modeling in the future. Things we can't currently afford with computational design can now be feasible on every job. Computational bins is where most people start. This is just stuff that makes your life better. Um, you don't want to be a CAD monkey, right? Doing the same things over and over again. Write a script to do it. Uh, there's thousands of little tasks that we can automate. And we put all those under computational bin. How to use Dynamo and Revit uh, to be a very effective uh, documenter. And data mechanics is this idea that there's data in everything we use. And uh, I personally barely scratch the surface. I actually would look to Zuby for a lot of uh, these ideas. Um, there's a lot we can do with data. You saw those dashboards, how we can design better. So this is really more a question or a challenge to all of us to say what, what data do we have, what data do we need, and what can we do with it? Um, because all of our workflows deal with a lot of information, but and we rarely use it effectively. So in summary, when we say what is computational design, we say this is a digital transformation hitting our industry. And it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody because our industry has been constantly changing. Maybe not as quickly, but if we think back to what we could do when all we had was hand drafting, how many people did we have just drawing documents? And then when we made the transition to, um, to AutoCAD and Revit, we were able to design, um, now Lead Silver is kind of a standard project. This is no longer groundbreaking. We've gotten a lot better. But what we're saying with Grasshopper and Dynamo, computational design in general, it's a paradigm shift as significant as shifting from hand drawing to AutoCAD. This is a really, really big deal. And we're all in the same spot. We're all racing to figure it out. But consider it like that. Because uh, we, we made this slide at first. We said, this is the future. This is right now. This is happening. Every company is racing to try to figure this out. Um, and that's why we're here, to help us all get there a little bit faster.